The world doesn't always see what God sees. The world sees a skateboarder. God sees a leader. The world sees teenagers just hanging out. God sees champions. The world sees a young man in a field, but God sees a king. The world says someday. God says today. You are valuable to God. You are vital to the success of His church. You are God's hero of the day. Watch and see what God can do through you. Rock family, it is good to see you this morning. How you guys doing? You guys good? Ready? Awake? Caffeinated? That's good. That's good. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm the youth pastor here at Rock Family. We also want to welcome everyone who is watching and joining us online. Uh, this morning, we're kind of interrupting our storyteller um, series. Pastor Dean will be concluding that series next Sunday. And then as you saw just a moment ago, uh, we've got a great series on uh, the importance of youth in the, cult, in the church today. So I'm looking forward to that greatly. But this morning, I want to share uh, just a, some quick thoughts with you. This is something... Um, I would say most of the messages that I share with you are something that God deals with me, and I figure if God's dealing with me, you guys get to get on board, and, and God gets to deal with you uh, too. And so I'm just going to kind of share some of the things that I feel like God is kind of like slapping me around with a little bit, and hopefully you don't feel too abused this morning. But I want to talk about resetting our default position, resetting our default position. Have you ever had that moment? You're like, I just need to hit a little reset in my life. Yes, I'm, I just need to hit reset. I mean, many times, sometimes it's just as simple as hitting that reset button. If you've ever done anything on a computer, sometimes it's like, I just need to reset. Yeah. I, just, I just need to reset. It's not working this morning even. Um, I came in this morning um, to, to print out the handouts that you guys uh, have, and the margins didn't print right, and so it was cutting all kind of things off, and I'm like, it worked two days ago. Why is it not working? Reset the computer, open it up, print it. No problem, just needed a simple reset. Sometimes we need to reset our health, diet, exercise, all those kind of things. We just need to hit reset. Sometimes we need to do a little reset um, in our marriage, in our relationships. I know many times played video games. I'm like, nope, not going the way I want and reset. We're gonna start this one over. But I wanna talk about resetting our default. When I'm talking about default, you know, the, the very beginning, if you ever got a new phone, uh, new computer, it's got default settings, or maybe you've accidentally restored your default settings and can throw you quite into a panic of, it was perfect the way that it was, and it, it, we go back to that default. Here's a definition of default um, that I saw. The preset selection of an option offered by a system which will always be followed except when explicitly altered a value when none is specified by the, reuser, by the user. What I'm gonna look at this morning is what is your default position? What's your default attitude? What's your default demeanor in life? And when we're talking about this, now we might think, well, my, this is my default, this is my default attitude. How you really know what your default is, ask someone that is close to you. Ask your spouse, ask your kids, ask someone that works very closely. What is my general attitude in life? Be careful of that answer. <laughs> because it, you might get that real honest answer back, and that's, and that's good, we, we, we need that. But you can really tell when the pressure of life comes on. When you're tired, when you're stressed out, when life adds a little bit of pressure, we find out what's really going on on the inside of you. I'll illustrate it like this. Uh, this morning I was in the refrigerator in the church kitchen. Church kitchens can be really fun. 
when it comes, because left by one ministry and it's there for a long time. And you're like, what, what is this? What, what is it? But I did find, I found this mustard. Some of the things I found, because this last week I was cleaning out the, the youth fridge. There were definitely some food items that were pre-COVID, like before it began. Um, it was manifesting. I'm just, I'm just, let me say. Uh, and so I thought I've got, I've got two options with this year two expired food items. Throw it away. Well, we've got a great game tonight to play at the beginning of youth um, because I, th- I think that's definitely where, where we need to go. No, but this is one of the things that I found in, in, in the kitchen this morning. This is what? You all sound so confident in, in, in this, except when I pour it out, it is, it is not quite... It's ketchup. You guys are little like that is some seriously fermented mustard when mustard expired. No, it's ketchup. Because when you, you, you can see what's on the outside, but what's on the inside may be a different thing. So many of us are really good at putting on a front with certain attitudes and smiles, but what's, what really is on the inside, that gets revealed when the pressure of life comes on, when life gets stressful. And so what we need to do, it's very easy to try to change what's on the outside, but the real need is to change what's on the inside. When pressure of life comes, it can crush you, it can form you, and it really can perfect you because it can show us, man, I didn't realize I've got this issue in my life. I need to, ch- I need to change. I need to adjust. I need to reset my default position. Romans chapter 12, verse two says this, stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Inward transformation. We all need this inward transformation. It's not just behavioral correction. Church is just not changing our behavior. Youth ministry is not behavioral modification program. We're working on the inside. That takes work especially if I get them one hour a week. It's a lot of work, but we're after inward transformation. Now we can recognize the fruit or the evidence of a problem, but unless we change the root, the inner parts, our thoughts, the heart attitude, we're never going to have the change that we really desire. And so this morning, I wanna give you four, uh, briefly, I wanna give you four kind of default positions that I would say God has been dealing with me. Maybe you can relate to one of these four, two, three, or four. Maybe you've got some additional ones. What I would encourage you at some point is to ask somebody close to you, kids, spouse, what are my default positions. When the pressure of life comes, where do I go? Here's, here's the ones that, that I deal with. Number one, uh, anger. Anger. Here's some signs. I'm just going to ask you some questions, maybe some thoughts. When, when you struggle with anger, some of these may take place. You don't always show anger, but when you do, look out. You lie awake at night and think about things that upset you during the day. You can get so angry at times, you can't even remember things that you said or did. Or when you're really upset, you often blurt out things that you later regret saying. Other people are afraid of your temper. Or when someone hurts you or frustrates you, you want to get even. There was a man, he said, another person will not hurt you without your cooperation. You are hurt the moment you believe yourself to be. We allow anger to sin. Mark Twain said this, anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. So it's not just anger being caused at somebody else that's going to cause hurt. It's going it's to hurt and it's going to corrupt you on the inside. Someone in scripture that I saw uh, that has an anger problem, you, if you look at the story of Moses, he definitely had a little bit of an anger problem. He was you know, born in kind of a miraculous time, miraculously saved, raised in the household of Pharaoh, 40 years later, he sees a Hebrew being hurt, injured, and so he goes and he kills the Egyptian. I would call that an anger problem. He leaves, he goes out to the desert, raises sheep, is selected and chosen by God to rescue his people out of slavery. He takes them out as leading God's people out 
to freedom, to meet with God, to worship God, an incredible time. Saw a lot of incredible miracles that were taking place. And there was one time that the people were just really ticking Moses off. God told him, speak to the rock. Water will come out. Moses gets a little bit angry and he strikes the rock instead because of this anger problem, part of it. He wasn't able to enter into the promised land that he probably could have. A little bit of an anger problem. A second default position that we need to look at in our, in our life is insecurity. Not everyone struggles with insecurity, but I know many of us do, and I know that I do. Here's some signs for those that struggle with insecurity. You sometimes feel completely unimportant. You're envious of others. You have to act just right and be perfect to feel okay. You allow yourselves to be treated like a doormat. You have a hard time saying no. You have difficulty speaking in front of a group, even a small one. You always think you've done something wrong. You often worry about what people think about you. You're great at blaming yourself. You can instantaneously give a list of everything that is wrong with you. And you feel you have to prove yourself. I love what Stephen Furtick said. He said, the reason we struggle with insecurity is because we compare our behind the scenes with everyone else's highlight reel. We all have at times, probably, I know I do, struggle with insecurity. We can look in scripture and we can see King Saul, I believe, struggled with a level of insecurity. When he was chosen to be king, the nation of Israel demanded they wanted to be like the rest of the nations. They wanted a king. Samuel comes to choose the king. And where is Saul, the man that's going to be king of the nation? He's hiding behind the luggage. He later hides behind the people when he sacrificed before the prophet came. He later hides his mistakes and wanted the people to like him, even after God rejected him as king. He later hid in a tent when the giant came, threatened the nation. He was jealous of a young boy, David, and all his accomplishments. His insecurity led to his downfall and removal. Now you've got the, almost the exact same issue just on the opposite side. You've got pride. Pride is a focus on yourself, just as insecurity is a focus on yourself. Pride is a focus on how great you are. Insecurity is a focus on yourself and how miserable you are. But here's pride. I put this picture up there because some of you need to smile right now and laugh because you're a terrifying bunch to look at sometimes. No, not really. <laughs> need you guys to smile. Come on. Help a guy out. Here's some signs of that pride may be an issue. You look down on those who have less than you. You brag about your accomplishments. You think of yourself as superior to others. You always think your way is the right way, the only way, and the best way. You're quick to point out faults with others. You become defensive when criticized or corrected. You have a hard time admitting that you need help. You have a hard time admitting you're wrong. And even a more difficult time asking for forgiveness. One of the major downfalls to pride is this constant disappointment, either in yourself or other people, because no one can live up to those kind of expectations. C.S. Lewis said this, a proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you cannot see something that is above you. Peter had an issue uh, with pride. I mean, he, he did a lot of great things and did a lot of great things. But there was one time he did try to tell Jesus what to do. <laughs> Jesus said, I'm, I'm going to die. And Peter's like, no, I've got a better plan got a better way. I'm not going to allow that to happen. He rejected knowing Christ when it was inconvenient. He went back to fishing after being disappointed when Christ died. Eventually, he had to be corrected by Paul when he was being hypocritical about eating with people that were different from him. We're all going to struggle with one of these. And the last one I want to kind of look at just for a moment is worry. Now, I could put a lot of other synonyms and a lot of other words next to worry. I could say stressed, overly busy, overwhelmed, Here's some signs that you may be overwhelmed, stressed, and worried. Do you tend to dwell on your problems? Do you feel insecure about the future? Do you feel burnt out all the time? Do you feel loose ends are hard to handle? Are you overly and extremely time conscious? Do you constantly rehash past events in the middle of the night? Are you defensive, and confrontational? Corey Ten Boom said this, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow, it empties today of its strength. That's a powerful statement. I see in scripture one of the, someone who was constantly worrying. Jesus spent a lot of time at a particular house, Mary and Martha and their brother. One time that he was over there, Mary is at Jesus' feet. 
Martha's cleaning, she's cooking, she's kind of getting the house ready. And both of these, I think, are important attitudes to have, but I think there's a time and a place for both. I think there's some people that have a tendency to just want to worship and never to serve. And I think some people really want to serve and have a hard time sitting and focusing and, and worshiping. I think, there's, I think there's both, and they both have their place. There's a time to clean, a time to serve, but there's also a time just to sit at Jesus' feet. And during one of these times that Jesus was over the house, it says in Luke chapter 10, Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you're worried and upset over all these details. There's only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Now, these are four default positions. I think all of us can probably relate to at least one of these, if not a couple of these. You may have your own to add to the list. Again, these were some that I felt like God was dealing with me, but how can they change? The good news is, is they can change. That's good news. We, we're not stuck in one place. You may have others. But if we want to change the fruit, we want to change the evidence of the problem, we've got to go inward. We've got to look at those core thoughts. We've got to look at the heart of the problem to change them. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says, Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power? For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one moment longer submitted to sin's power. We have a new identity. I think that is, that is good news. Now, because I think some people kind of hold on to a former identity. Well, I was, I was born this way. I was born into this family. I was born into this nationality. Because I'm this nationality, I'm just kind of this way. Because I'm this particular birth order in my family, then I'm just kind of this way. But when we belong to Christ, that identity has got to go away. We've got to hold on to a new identity and form and build a new default position. Colossians chapter three says, your crucifixion with Christ has severed the tie to this life. And now your true life is hidden away in God, in Christ. And as Christ himself is seen for who he really is, for who you really are will also be revealed for you are now one with him in his glory. We were crucified with Christ. The old life has got to go away. Second Corinthians chapter five says, for it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and holds us tightly because we are convinced that he has given his life for all of us. For you are now one with him. I went back to the last verse. This means we all die with him. In verse 14, Paul is actually using a word where we get the English word echo. We're supposed to echo his love in this life. By the way that we live, by the way that we love, we are to be echoing God's and heaven's love for us. In verse 17, it goes on, says, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new person. All that is related to the old order has vanished. Everything is fresh and renewed. We're not just reformed. We're not just refurbished. We are made brand new in Christ. Ephesians chapter five says, be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. We're made completely new. Make the most of every opportunity. I want you to live free. I'm, this, this church wants you to live free. God wants you to live free, not just of, of sin and not just of the penalty of sin, but also from an empty life. God wants you to live a fulfilling and free life. So I want to give you just a couple of thoughts on how we can build some new default positions in our life. A couple of things. Number one, write this down. Number one, focus. Here, the key is focus. You're going to see the word focus on all these. Focus on changing one default at a time. Focus on one at a time. I think it's important to start somewhere, to pick one. At the beginning of every year, my wife and I sit down and we'll talk about youth ministry and the things that we want to adjust. And, hey, what do you think about this and this? And, you know, she'll tell me, well, what areas in the youth ministry do you want to improve? And I will list like 17 different things. No, no pick one. I can't. They all need to be fixed. Well, what's, what's one area in our, in, our, in our family life? And so I'll go through and I'll pick all of these different things. No, pick one. 
pick one because it's a lot easier to focus on one, to build one, to grow in one area and then move on to the next. It's like the Dave Ramsey's debt snowball thing. If you apply the FPU principles into your life, you focus on one and then you roll that over into the next. You're rolling over your effort in your life and focusing on one default at a time. Because if you sit down and you list all of the areas in your life that you need to work on, that can be quite overwhelming. Let's pick one. Pick one. Spouse, let them pick, pick, focus on one. Don't fix all of them. Just let's focus on one area in our life and work on that number. Uh, Proverbs chapter 17 says, this person with understanding is always looking for wisdom, but the mind of a fool wanders everywhere. Focus on one thing. Number two, focus on victory one day at a time. One day at a time. One day at a time. If you trip up, if you mess up, man, start over. Because otherwise, well, I'm just going to wait till I messed up today. I'll wait till next week to start over. No, start, don't, 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 wait that, don't wait that long. Start over. I messed up, I'll start over. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 says, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes. Focus one day at a time. Number three, focus on what I want, not what I don't want. Focus on what I want, not what I don't want. I believe that you're gonna, the direction that you focus on, whatever you focus on is the area, is the direction that you're gonna shift towards. You're gonna move towards. I always, with, with my students, I always talk about food because it's the easiest thing for me to talk about. Because I love food. Careful. And so when, I, when I'm focusing on, when I'm focusing on, on the things that I, that I want, the things that I need, the things that are going to be helpful, it's easier to narrow in on that, not all the things I can't. About two or three weeks ago, um, uh, my buddy Greg and I did a triathlon. And so for the two months prior, we were extremely focused on what we were eating on the good things, all the things that we can eat, all the things, because if I started focusing on the things I can eat, that's what I'm going to. Don't open the pantry, don't open the fridge, don't open the fridge. I, I knew the very few things that, that I could eat so that I could, I didn't want to die doing the triathlon. I didn't want Greg to finish and be like, where the heck is Matt? <laughs> I didn't want to drown. I didn't want to fall off the bike. I didn't want to pass out while I was running. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to finish. And I, so I was focusing, well, I can eat this three things. But I, was, I, I, I learned when I went to the grocery store, I need to stay to the perimeter. I need to stay along the perimeter because the perimeter has a whole lot more healthy things. You start going up and down the aisles, it gets dangerous real quick. I know to avoid the freezer aisle because I'm going right for the ice cream. I'm going right for the aisle. I've got to avoid that aisle. I've got to avoid soda aisle. I've got to avoid anything with sugar. I've got to avoid the candy aisle. I've, there's all those things. I've got, to, I've got to avoid these. I can have meat. And that's about it. No, <laughs> well, I, can, I can have this. I can have, I can have, I can have, I have a little bit of bacon. I can have eggs. Okay, I'm going to focus on the bacon. You know what? Life was pretty good. Life was pretty good because I focused on the things that I could have, not on the things that I couldn't have. In your relationship, in your, in your marriage, focus on the one that you do have, not on all the other options. Some of you are like, what? Yes. Yes. Don't focus on all the things you can have because that's when you drift. That's when you move in the direction you know you shouldn't. Focus on the things that you want, not on things you don't want. Philippians 4 verse 8 says, keep your thoughts continually fixed on all that is authentic and real, honorable and admirable, beautiful and respectful, pure and holy, merciful and kind, and fasten your thoughts on every glorious work of God, praising him, always focus on what you want. Number four, focus on doing good, not feeling good. Focus on doing good, not feeling good. If we focus on feeling good, what I do is not going to bring lasting change because I'm going to remain comfortable instead of growing. Now, when I say doing good, I'm not saying that you're going to earn points in heaven. You're going to earn your salvation. Doing good should be an overflow out of your love for God. I love God. Therefore, there's going to be an overflow. I'm going to love people in my marriage. Feeling good is wife, make me dinner. She's not here to correct me. She's probably watching online right now, yelling at me right now. 
Doing good is serving my wife. Feeling good is about me. Doing good is about other people. We need to live our life doing good, not just trying to feel good. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, let, let me emphasize this. As you yield to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of yourself life. Focus on doing good, not feeling good. Number five, focus on people who will help me, not hinder me. Focus on people who will help me, not hinder me. My encouragement to you is to bring into your life people who are going to help you. If you're feeling down, depressed, or angry at me, look at the picture of the dogs on the screen. It will make your life better. Bring people into your life who are going to help you, who are going to encourage you, who are going to challenge you, who are going to make you better, who are going to build you up, who are going to hold you up, who are going to pray with you and for you. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, people can improve each other. Bring people into life to build you up. Number six, focus on progress, not on perfection. Focus on progress, not on perfection. That's hard for the perfectionist in the room. How many of you, you know you're a perfectionist? There's no, okay, it's my people. I have an unhealthy level of perfectionism, I know. I know, like to the place where I've had to seek professional counseling, and I'm not joking. It is unhealthy to live with that level of perfectionism because no one can achieve that level of perfectionism. My goal Someone told me a long time ago, I don't even remember who said it, but I've held on to it. My goal for progress, not perfection. Yes, the goal is perfectionism, per perfection. Because Jesus is my goal, Jesus is perfect. Yes, he's my goal. My goal, progress. I wanna become a little bit more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. If that's, if, if, if I'm more like Jesus today than I was yesterday, then I've made progress. I just, 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 just a little bit in one way, one relationship, one, one thing. I want to become a little bit more like him. That's progress. Philippians 1 verse 6, God began doing a good work in you, and I'm sure he will continue it until it is finished when Jesus Christ comes again. He began something. Allow him to keep working. Just move closer to him. Number seven, focus on God's power, not willpower. Focus on God's power, not willpower. I struggle to willpower myself into eating healthy and exercising. That's difficult. I was asked recently, you know, how do you, how do you find motivation to exercise? I'm like, I don't. No motivation, ever. The morning comes, the alarm clock goes off, the motivation is not there. It is simply, I don't want to die in the next race. That's my motivation. I, I, to become a better father, to become a better husband, to become a better youth pastor, yeah, I'm gonna need a little bit more than willpower. I need God's power in my life. To be a better husband, a better father, better youth pastor, better son, better employee, better child of God, I need the Holy Spirit in me. I don't just need willpower, I need God's power in my life. Philippians 4.13 says, I have strength for all things in Christ who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength into me. I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. I need God's power in my life. And yes, God's gonna bring the results, but I do have a part to play. I, ha I have my part. I'm, I'm partnering with him but I'm expecting that God is gonna move on my behalf. Second Chronicles 16, nine says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. I'm gonna give you one last fill in the blank, but don't check out because I've got a few more things I wanna share with you. The reset, here's your reset. Reset, your default position is complete reliance on God. That sounds simple. Hitting a reset button sounds simple, but there's something that we need to carry out and live out every single day. We can look at a few people uh, in scripture. We can look at, it says uh, about Jesus. I mean, yes, it's, it's Jesus, but he was also focused on God. He prayed, God, he prayed to his father, let your will be done, not mine. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one and two, then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination for the path has already been marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm. We focus our attention and expectation on Jesus. I focus on 
him who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. He endured the agony of the cross, conquered its humiliation, and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. We see David had this default position of prayer. When his people were coming to kill him, he focused on God and prayed. Even when he committed a horrible sin, when Nathan the prophet came, he repented. He didn't blame. He changed. He kept his heart focused on God. You can look at David. He prayed. You can look at Chad, Rabbi Meshach, a minute ago. They focused on God. You see Esther, her life, she realized when she was going to go stand before the king, she realized her life wasn't in the king's hand. She knew her life was in God's hand. She completely relied on God. I close with this, one of my favorites I've shared before, but Stephen, one of the seven men who were chosen to assist the apostles in the book of Acts. Scripture describes him as a man full of faith and power and miracles. The religious leaders hate him. They falsely accused him at his trial, but his face became as bright as an angel. And then he shared this one message in the book of Acts as he was about to be executed. And verse 55 of Acts 7 says, Stephen, overtaken with great faith, was full of the Holy Spirit. He fixed his gaze, fixed, he focused. He focused on heaven and to the heavenly realm and saw the glory and splendor of God and Jesus who stood up at the right hand of God. Look, Stephen said, I can see the heavens opening and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God to welcome me home. His accusers came and killed him and he died. But if you'll notice, it said that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. You see everywhere else in scripture, Jesus is always sitting at the right. He's always seated at the right hand of the Father. He, Jesus is always seated, but here he's, Stephen sees Jesus standing. I believe Stephen saw Jesus standing as he was receiving a standing ovation coming into heaven. It's how I wanna leave this life. When this life is over, I wanna be welcomed into heaven by Jesus, standing, welcoming me home. Let's reset our default position in every relationship that we have so that those around us can see the life that is on the inside of us. Let them see God's love. Let them see God's life so that they too can have the same relationship we have. Will you stand with me? But as you stand, I just want you to close your eyes for just one moment. In a moment, we'll give you an invitation. If you do not have a relationship with God, we're gonna give you that invitation to be able to open up your life to him. But I just wanna ask you this question. First and most important, do you have a relationship with God? If you do not, we're gonna give you that opportunity. But I know that there is many of us in this room that we need to reset our default position to a reliance on God. When we reset our anger, we can have joy. When we reset our insecurity, we can have security. When we reset our pride, we can have humility. When we reset our worry, we can have grace. Allow God this morning to reveal his eternity changing love for you and then begin to build that relationship with him through prayer, through worship. Father, will you speak to each one of us this morning and show us where we are at, the areas in our life that we need to become more like you. Father, show us this morning so we can reflect heaven's love, echo God's life to those around us. We thank you for Will you look up at me this morning before we close? If you do not have a relationship with Christ, we want to give you that opportunity right now. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. The rest of the room is going to cheer and shout. Someone is going to come alongside and pray a very simple prayer with you and introduce you to the one that will eventually welcome you home. If that's you, you need a relationship with Christ. One, maybe you've walked away from God but this morning you're ready to come back home too. If either of those of you, three, will you just raise your hand? You want, desire, need a relationship with God. Will you raise your hand high enough so that I can see it? Someone around you can see it and someone is gonna come alongside and pray with you this morning. Is there anybody back here this morning? I see, do I see a hand? Do I see a hand? Awesome. Thank you, miss. Thank you. Is there anybody else on this side of the room? God bless you. 
We love you. We thank you. We'll see you next week. Teenagers, we'll see you tonight. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed the service. If you live here in Colorado Springs or you're going to be in the city, I hope that you'll come and experience the service firsthand. And for those of you that are enjoying the ministry and you're being fed to on a weekly basis, I invite you to partner with us financially and make an investment into the mission and the vision of Rock Family Church. And lastly, if you've never made a commitment and a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, would you make that decision today? Why wait till tomorrow? Why wait till next weekend? I dare you to pray this prayer with me. Would you close your eyes? Would you pray this prayer with me and repeat it? It goes like this. Pray this with me. Say, dear God, forgive me of all of my sins and mistakes. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I invite him to be the Lord of my life. Thank you for loving me and forgiving me. My life is now in your hands. Jesus Christ is my Lord. Amen. Hey, thanks for making that commitment. Will you email us at info at rockfamilychurch.com. Tell us about your new decision to stand up big and live strong for Jesus Christ. We'd love to celebrate with you. God bless you guys. We'll see you next weekend.